May 2004, three matching suitcases scattered across the Chesapeake Bay in Virginia. The latest and third suitcase containing human remains was brought ashore Sunday. Police got a tip from a recreational boater about its location in the water near the second island of the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel. Then last Tuesday, a student researcher found the second one on Fisherman's Island. What's inside as bad as you can imagine? The contents were covered with a thick trash bag, like a hefty bag or something. And I said, uh-oh. I was a little bit nervous then when I saw the black uh, bags in there. So it's a turn to say something to D. And while I was talking to D, the young boy reached down and ripped open the plastic trash bags. There was no doubt of what it was. It was a set of human legs. The person inside the suitcases was 39-year-old Bill McGuire. The unsettling question echoed, who was Bill? And what secrets did he hold that might have made him a target for such a gruesome end? In the heart of New Jersey, situated in a region called Woodbridge Township, it's a place where diverse cultures blend seamlessly, creating a unique charm. Woodbridge is more than just a location. It's a home filled with warmth and stories. Talking about safety, Woodbridge Township is a generally secure place. With a low crime percentage, the community enjoys a sense of peace and security. The parks and waterfront not only provide scenic beauty, but also serve as communal spaces where families and individuals can unwind without worry. Yet beneath this friendly exterior, there's a chilling tale that shook the town. The story of Bill McGuire is a dark moment that unfolded in this seemingly peaceful town. It's a reminder that even in the most everyday places, mysteries can be hidden. William Theodore McGuire, also known as Bill, was born on September 21, 1964 in Bloomfield, New Jersey. He was the son of William Christopher McGuire and Ruth Theodora Sell McGuire. Bill grew up in Bloomfield and graduated from Bloomfield High School in 1982. He then went on to study computer science at Rutgers University, where he graduated in 1986. After college, Bill worked as a computer programmer for a variety of companies. He was a hard worker and was well respected by his colleagues. In his free time, Bill enjoyed playing golf, fishing, and spending time with his family. Bill was a kind and generous man who was always willing to help others. He was a charismatic and witty individual. He got married to Marcy Pollock in 1986, but that marriage was short-lived, leading to their divorce in 1994. The couple moved to Virginia Beach in 1986, where Bill worked as an electronics technician in the Navy. Marcy, originally from Vernon, New Jersey, joined him in this relocation. Around 1990, Bill and Marcy returned to the Atlantic City area. However, it was in this new setting that Bill's behavior changed drastically. He became deeply involved in excessive gambling and drinking. This is when Marcy noticed a stark deterioration in their relationship. The situation escalated in 1995 when Marcy filed a restraining order against him after Bill threw rocks through her window, ultimately leading to their divorce. Bill then met Melanie Lynn Slate in 1998 at a restaurant in Woodbridge, New Jersey, where Melanie was working part-time while attending nursing school. Born on October 8, 1972 in America, Melanie Lynn McGuire, formerly known as Melanie Lynn Slate, grew up in Ridgewood in Middletown Township, New Jersey, attending Middletown High School South. Her academic journey took her to Rutgers University, where she pursued a dual major in math and psychology, graduating in 1994. Achieving the second position in her class, she earned her nursing diploma from the Charles E. Gregory School of Nursing, now Raritan Bay Medical Center, in 1997. When he met Melanie, she perfectly complimented his personality. They quickly fell in love and were married the following year in 1999. The couple soon started a family, welcoming two sons into their lives. In 2000, they had their first child, a son. Two years after that, in 2002, they had their second child, another son. Their marriage seemed picture perfect, filled with love and laughter. However, beneath the surface, cracks were beginning to appear. Financial struggles began to weigh heavily on the couple. Bill, a computer programmer, had always been responsible and financially secure, but his gambling addiction took a toll on their finances. As debts piled up, stress on their relationship grew. 
Melanie, a nurse, worked tirelessly to support the family, but it was becoming increasingly difficult to make ends meet. In addition to their financial woes, Bill's gambling addiction also led to emotional turmoil. He would often disappear for days at a time, leaving Melanie to care for the children and manage the household on her own. The trust that was once the foundation of their marriage began to erode, replaced by suspicion and resentment. Despite the growing tensions, Melanie remained committed to her marriage, hoping that things would eventually improve. She tried to help Bill overcome his addiction, but his struggles continued, further straining their relationship. In 2004, the McGuires were planning to move to a larger home in Warren County, New Jersey. They had closed on a new house on April 28, 2004. But before they could move in, the unthinkable happened. On April 29, 2004, Bill vanished from his seemingly ordinary life, leaving behind a trail of unanswered questions and a family in despair. Where did Bill go? What could have been the reason for his sudden disappearance? Weeks had slipped by without a trace of Bill. His absence left a gaping void in the lives of his caring wife and children. But little did they know that Bill's fate was far more extraordinary than they could have ever imagined. On the early morning of May 5, 2004, three fishermen, Chris, Don, and their children, went on a fishing trip from Virginia Beach toward the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel. As they headed north, parallel to the tunnel, they stumbled upon an unexpected catch a dark green suitcase floating in the water. Intrigued by the mysterious object, they hauled it aboard their boat. The suitcase was surprisingly heavy, and upon opening it, they made a chilling discovery. Inside was a black sack containing a pair of legs. Horrified by their find, the fishermen immediately contacted police. They wondered if there were more suitcases hidden in the depths of the Chesapeake Bay, each concealing another piece of a human body. Soon police started actively looking for the other missing pieces of this disturbing puzzle. Just days after the first suitcase was found, a student studying the nature reserve on Fisherman's Island made another chilling discovery. A second suitcase, identical to the first, was found on the beach on May 10, 2004. This time, however, it was a human torso, including the arms and head. The wait for answers continued as the search for the missing body parts intensified. Five days after the second suitcase was found, a fisherman made the final gruesome discovery. On May 15, 2004, a third suitcase, again identical to the first two, was found floating in the Chesapeake Bay. Inside were the victim's pelvis and legs. With the Chesapeake Bay's vast expanse making the search area challenging, investigators decided to turn to the public for help. They released the victim's sketch in the media, hoping that someone would recognize him. Incredibly, it took only a few days for the sketch to yield results. Susan Rice and John Rice, close friends of Bill who hadn't seen him in weeks, played a pivotal role in identifying his body. When they saw a sketch of the victim on TV on May 21, 2004, Sue immediately recognized her friend's distinctive features. Skeptical at first, her husband John also agreed that the sketch bore a striking resemblance to Bill. Recognizing their friend's face, they promptly notified the authorities. The couple also provided crucial information to the investigation. They recalled that Bill had recently been involved in a physical altercation with his wife, Melanie McGuire, and had stormed out of their home. They assumed that he had impulsively fled to Atlantic City, distracting himself on a gambling spree. However, weeks passed without any contact from Bill, raising concern among his friends and family. With Bill's identity confirmed, investigators immediately initiated a fingerprint analysis. Fortunately, Bill's fingerprints were on file and a match was quickly established. The once missing man was now the victim of a horrific crime. Bill's past was shrouded in mystery, with rumors of gambling addiction, domestic abuse, and even a restraining order. Bill's ex-wife, Marcy Pollock, had also spoken out about the emotional and physical abuse she endured during their marriage. She had described their relationship as deteriorating rapidly after their wedding, culminating in a restraining order in 1995 after Bill threw a rock at her window. These allegations painted a troubling picture of Bill's character and only made it difficult to identify the perpetrator. Investigators were now faced with the task of piecing together the events that led to Bill McGuire's death 
and bringing the perpetrator to justice. The question remains, who was the killer? Imagine a loved one vanishing without a trace, even if it's just for a day. You'd be worried and scared, and you'd do everything you could to find them. Even if you had an argument with them, you would still report them missing to the police. However, in this case, the police received no missing person reports from Melanie regarding Bill's disappearance after being away for almost a month. Instead of immediately reporting him missing, she sought legal counsel from a divorce attorney. On April 30, 2004, she filed a restraining order against him, further indicating that she felt unsafe in his presence. State your full name. Melanie Lynn McGuire. Tell me what uh, happened that brought you to court today for a temporary restraining order. Um, my husband and I closed on our first house on Wednesday. Um, that should be a positive thing. Shouldn't yeah, it should. Um, he's been behaving really erratically. Ms. McGuire, you're safe here. Don't worry. Did he hit you, ma'am? Um, no, not until, well, I don't mean to sound like I had absolutely no part in this. I said some not nice things and slapped me. The police were surprised that Bill's wife hadn't reported him missing, especially since they had found the person in the sketch through Bill's friends. The cops decided to look into Melanie McGuire, and what they found was pretty odd. On April 30th, 2004, just two days after the big fight between her and Bill, she did something that would make most folks raise an eyebrow. I'm starting to become more actively angry at, at him. And I'm thinking, that son of a bitch, I know where he is. Melanie believed he might be in Atlantic City gambling, so she planned to drive down there and search for his car. Absolutely not rational, but get in the car and, and go down there. And I'm driving down, and I take the first pass on this highway, and I see a dark sedan. There's no way. There's no way. She said her goal was to annoy him by parking the car in the most hectic part of town. Pull off onto a little side street, and I parked my car, and it was like Mission Impossible. Scooted up to the car, got in, started it, and drove away. But interestingly here was how people reacted to her. That just didn't make any sense. Like he was physically abusive to her, but then she goes to mess with a car with a guy that she claims she doesn't want to be around. As the police began monitoring Melanie's activities, they also started tracking her phone calls. In the midst of seemingly ordinary conversations, the police discovered a crucial piece of evidence. In one of these intercepted conversations, Melanie talked to Jim Finn, an old acquaintance from nursing school who had a crush on her. After losing touch for some time, they reconnected in February 2004, with Melanie reaching out when she needed something. Aware of Jim's interest in firearms, she discussed Bill's behavior with him before his disappearance, and Jim, still harboring feelings for Melanie, suggested obtaining a gun for self-defense. The reason I didn't shoot Bill buying a gun is because my husband wanted one. You wanted one? Yeah. I don't like to keep all the ones that I bought with her. Why didn't you tell me? However, investigators listening to their conversations concluded that Jim had no knowledge of any plans related to a murder. When questioned by detectives, Jim was surprised to learn about Melanie purchasing a gun and was unaware of her involvement in any foul play. She then purchased a 38 caliber handgun on April 26, 2004 from a store in Easton, Pennsylvania. This was just two days before Bill went missing. Despite constant monitoring and scrutiny, Melanie denied any participation, maintaining her innocence. Is there anything else you're not telling me? Like what? Like I killed him. I want you to tell me the truth. There was another unexplained road trip, this time to Delaware, just five days after her husband's disappearance. Melanie had told Dr. Miller that she was actually furniture shopping in the early hours of May 4, 2004. However, investigators suspect that this trip to Delaware for furniture was a cover up. The route she took would typically lead to the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel, contrary to the usual path via the New Jersey Turnpike toward the Delaware Memorial Bridge and Route 13, which heads south to the Chesapeake Bay Bridge and Tunnel. Patty Precioso says that Melanie actually left the night before from New Jersey, drove Bill's remains to Virginia. We believe that that was when she took the suitcases with Bill's remains and got rid of them in the Chesapeake Bay. And the first suitcase turned up the very next day 
But of course, Melanie thinks this theory is preposterous. She stated that this theory was absurd because Virginia Beach was an additional 450 miles away from Delaware. Considering the considerable distance, it was implausible to cover such a vast stretch within a limited time frame. Was Melanie McGuire truly acting alone, or was there an accomplice involved? Maybe it was Jim Flynn, but why would someone go to such lengths for a girl he had a crush on years ago? Yet consider this. It could be someone else, someone closer. A secret affair, perhaps. Was it someone who would do anything, even kill for her? It is now 2.30 p.m., May 31st, 2005. Brad Miller making an outgoing call to Melanie McGuire. Hello? I've told him everything that I know. But they're, you know, they just don't. They, they want you to break. I mean, if you want us to stick together, i got to know everything now before this goes any further. What do you mean you have to know everything now? I mean, there's no other secrets between us, right? I like it, that go. You swear you had nothing to do with us? Yeah. And your children's lives. Because I'm standing by you. The voice you heard was of Dr. Brad Miller. He was a partner at RMA Associates, and Melanie worked as one of his nurses. What appealed to you about Brad Miller? He was just very, very tender. Uh, I really tried to fight it, but I couldn't. I couldn't fight it. The affair between them officially began when Melanie was eight months pregnant with her second child, at least for both of them. He was so kind. I'd come back to my desk after a long meeting with a patient and there'd be lunch sitting on my desk waiting for me. You know, there was always a little bit of, of flirtation, banter back and forth. I was about to go out on maternity leave and I was sitting actually in his office at his desk. I just mentioned I have a pinched nerve in, in my neck and he just, he put his hands on my shoulders and started to, to rub my back. I tried to, I really tried to fight it because I, this was not going to be good. <laughs> this was not going to be good for anybody, but I couldn't, I couldn't fight it. After Melanie returned from maternity leave, she and Dr. Miller began a full-blown affair. It appeared as if they were falling deeply in love with each other, despite their marital ties and young children. Investigators uncovered mounting evidence indicating Melanie McGuire's involvement in her husband's murder. Bill's car held a bottle of chloral hydrate, a sedative, along with two syringes prescribed by Bradley Miller, who had said the prescription was written in Melanie's handwriting. During the investigation, Jennifer Seymour, a state police computer expert, analyzed the computers and handheld devices belonging to the McGuire's, including a desktop computer situated in their apartment. Her examination revealed that between April 11th and April 26, 2004, several concerning topics were searched online. Among the searches were inquiries about undetectable poisons, how to purchase guns illegally, how to commit murder, gun laws, and toxic insulin levels. Among all the evidence, the gun, the internet search, or the affair, one particular detail left people confused. It was the purchase of a half-million-dollar house, which occurred right before his disappearance. He was constantly looking, looking, looking at homes. He wanted to end up buying a house before he turned 40. You did want to move down here to Virginia Beach. We took pictures of houses in our neighborhood, but Melanie just would not hear of it. They ended up placing a substantial deposit on an impressive home in New Jersey. This residence was quite lavish, with a significant amount of land and carrying a price tag of half a million dollars. This seemed contradictory. On one hand, Melanie was growing closer to Dr. Miller, but on the other, she was making a major investment in a new property with Bill. So why were you buying this half a million dollar house together then? The idea for me was we had a chunk of money, cash, that we were putting down on this house. In the past, we had come to points where we had been in similar situations, and he would, ultimately something would happen and he would go and gamble the money away. I figured this at least was an investment. On April 28, 2004, they were set to close on the house at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Melanie stayed in touch with Dr. Miller throughout as he pleaded with her not to proceed with the house purchase. He expressed a wish to be with her and build a future together. Melanie assured him she would handle it. 
After closing on the house, they returned to their rented townhouse. Bill, quite excited, called John Rice, reportedly in a very happy state. Melanie's final conversation that night was with Dr. Miller. She informed him that they had closed on the house and mentioned that Bill was asleep on the couch after having some red wine. Melanie planned to discuss matters with Bill when he woke, intending to request a divorce. Melanie recounted the events as a significant argument between her and Bill, stating that they had a fight in the early hours of the morning, around 3 or 4 o'clock. It all started regarding the house they were purchasing, with Melanie mentioning that she had settled for that particular house. Bill's reaction was immediate and intense, expressing dissatisfaction and stating that it wasn't what he wanted. He mentioned his preference for a cheaper house in Virginia, which Melanie refused, leading to an escalating, heated exchange. Melanie further described that the argument turned physical, specifying that Bill pushed a dryer sheet into her mouth, revealing his fixation with dryer sheets during such moments. We're still arguing, and there's the laundry basket, and there's a dryer sheet just hanging out of one of the baby's sleeves. He hated the he thought it was lazy that I wouldn't stand there and put in the liquid fabric softener, and um, yeah, <laughs> and it went out of control. This was the type of mother I was, um, that I would leave this, this sheet in there for, for my baby to possibly choke on. Before I know it, I'm up against the, the wall, and the dryer sheet is being shoved into my throat. And then he just smacked me. In the face? Yeah, open hand because he probably would have broken my cheek if it had been a closed fist. Um, and I looked down, and there's my two-year-old. I grabbed the baby and went to the bathroom right behind me and shut the door. I just wanted away from him at that point. He informed her that he was leaving and wouldn't return, even instructing her to explain to their children why they wouldn't have a father. He communicated this through the bathroom door while he packed and made several trips up and down the stairs, continuously criticizing her. Her final words to him were a plea to stop. After discovering the suitcases, the police were finally on the verge of bringing justice to Bill. One crucial piece of evidence the police were eagerly seeking, yearning for proof of Melanie's involvement in the dismemberment, remained elusive. Despite thoroughly searching her home, they found no blood, no bullets, Nothing. There was no direct physical evidence linking her to the murder. Over a year after Bill McGuire's murder, on June 5, 2005, Melanie McGuire was arrested while dropping off her kids at a daycare in Metuchen. She was charged with first-degree murder in what became known as the Suitcase Killer case. Melanie pleaded not guilty and was released on $750,000 bail. In 2005, a grand jury indicted her on four counts, raising her bail to $2.1 million. She was again released. Another indictment later accused her of writing letters that obstructed the investigation. Three years after the murder, in 2007, Melanie's trial began. The prosecution argued that she killed her husband in 2004 to start a new life with her boyfriend. Lead investigator Prezioso testified that the evidence points to a well-planned murder. Melanie maintained her innocence, stating that her husband was a compulsive gambler who had become increasingly erratic. However, a spokesman for the New Jersey Division of Criminal Justice disputed her characterization, saying that there was no indication that Mr. McGuire was anything more than an occasional gambler. Melanie's defense team argued that the murder and dismemberment could not have happened in the Woodbridge apartment because there was no evidence to support this claim. They highlighted the absence of blood, tissue, or DNA in the apartment as well as the lack of a bullet or saw marks. Additionally, there were no testimonies from neighbors regarding gunshots or the sound of a power saw. Three years later, on April 23, 2007, Melanie McGuire, 34, was found guilty of killing William T. McGuire, dismembering his body, packing the pieces in three suitcases, and tossing them into the Chesapeake Bay. She was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole for 63 years and nine months. She also received a concurrent 10-year sentence for desecrating human remains and a further 5-year sentence for perjury for lying to a family court judge about her husband's whereabouts after he vanished in 2004. William and Melanie McGuire's two sons, whose identities are protected for their privacy and safety, were last seen with their father on April 28, 2004. Melanie dropped the boys, aged 2 and 4, off at their daycare as usual around 8.20 a.m. 
After their routine, the boys returned home expecting to see their father, but he was nowhere to be found. William and Melanie's sons were placed in the care of Bill's elder sister, Cindy Lagosh, a realtor at the Weikert office in Franklin Lakes. Cindy, along with her husband, pharmacist Bill Lagosh of Wyckoff, New Jersey, were deemed capable of providing a loving and nurturing environment for the boys. They already had two adult children of their own, Laura Lagosh and Max Lagosh, and were experienced parents. When the question of custody arose, the two boys were sent to live with Cindy and Bill, especially since they were already a close-knit family. After Melanie was convicted of murdering her husband, her family initiated a custody battle with Cindy, but to no avail. As a result, William and Melanie's sons continue to reside in New Jersey with their aunt, uncle, and cousins, the only family they've ever known. In 2007, during Melanie's murder trial, Cindy presented evidence that both of her sister-in-law's children, then aged five and seven, had been diagnosed with autism. Cindy had grown concerned about their well-being upon noticing their behavior and had them tested. Due to the protection of their identities, no further information regarding their current status is available. However, it's known that the boys have not had contact with their mother since before her conviction. If you've watched the entire video without missing a moment, you probably have numerous questions about the investigation and arrest. After looking at her history as a nurse and her caring and charismatic nature, it's hard to even consider if someone like Melanie could commit such a heinous crime. The high-profile nature of the case prompted a range of opinions among viewers. Many believe that there are many gaps in the story, beginning with the fact that she doesn't quite appear to be capable of murder. Even if she had the motive, how could this small woman accomplish it all alone? Did someone assist her? Was she unfairly charged? Perhaps the jury overlooked someone, or was the accusation entirely mistaken? If you're pondering these questions, you're not alone. Many people, including criminology professors Megan Sachs and Amy Schlossberg, doubt Melanie McGuire's guilt. They host a podcast, Direct Appeal, questioning her conviction, pointing out that Melanie doesn't fit the typical profile of a murderer. So you believe an innocent woman is behind bars right now? Absolutely. I believe this is a case of a wrongful conviction. So let's talk about some of the questions you raise in your podcast, and let's begin with the gun. The gun to this day has never been recovered. The key witness for the prosecution, a forensic ballistics expert, stated that the bullets found in Bill's case were identified as 38 caliber lead cutter bullets. No one plugged the serial number of my gun into a website to find out what the specifications were. Apparently each gun makes something called lands and grooves. Lands and grooves are rifling characteristics that are machine pressed into the barrel of a gun. And when the bullet passes through the barrel, the same number of lands and grooves are going to be imprinted essentially onto that bullet. There were five lands and grooves that my weapon was said to have made based on the company's website. The bullets that came out of my husband had six lands and grooves. Subsequently, they found an error on the gun manufacturer's website. What's puzzling is that the website information was altered after the unfortunate incident involving Bill McGuire's murder. After this trial to incorporate the possibility of that it could or six, have I five or six. I thought that was questionable. I think it's very questionable that for years historically it says one thing and then it's updated right after. Post this, they also discussed the garbage bags found at the McGuire residence and the one Bill was found in. You can see these lines here. There's a straight line here, this sort of smooth line. There's also two other lines close together in basically the exact same position. Well, this indicates that these two bags were made at the same facility on the same line within a very close proximity of time. The investigator highlights that these characteristics indicate that the two bags were made at the same facility on the same production line and within a very brief time frame. Furthermore, they express confidence in their conclusion, drawing from conducted tests and observed results, affirming that the bags were produced during the same run. They put on a really good show. And I think when you have props, two garbage bags, oh wow, those do look alike. And so what the jurors are listening to sounds like fact, when in reality, it's just someone's expert opinion. Sachs also emphasizes the physical challenges of dismembering a body and the lack of a believable crime scene. 
In a video demonstration, they conducted two tests. The first was a suitcase weight test, assessing whether Melanie, weighing 118 pounds, could have thrown a suitcase of similar weight, around 80 pounds, across a bridge with a guardrail height of 40 inches. Their findings suggested that a reasonably manageable weight to lift was around 40 pounds, approximately half of Melanie's weight. There is something else that's significant that you think the jury should have heard more about that was found inside those suitcases. If you look through the lab reports, page upon page upon page, white hair, brown hair, black hair, animal hair, I think that's indicative that there was animal hair where the dismemberment took place of, of Bill's body. You mentioned uh, that you found some animal hairs. Did you find anything that you considered of evidential value? No. And they looked high and low to connect Melanie to some pet. And once they found that there was no way to connect Melanie to these pet hairs, it became not of evidentiary value. Why is that? Simply because they don't match your suspects? Those hairs should have been tested because that's a huge question mark. Despite a movie about her case coming out, Melanie remains in prison. Despite the attention, she insists she didn't kill her husband or dispose of his body parts in suitcases. And why would she drive all the way down to Chesapeake with the body parts in the car, thinking, I'm not going to get stopped, I'm not going to break down? Yes. What a chance that is. You know, I mean, you can't stop on a bridge and open a window and throw three suitcases out. can't make anybody believe who's convinced that I've done this, that I didn't. All I can continue to do is tell the truth, and it's not the most flattering truth. But it's the truth. In the puzzling case of Melanie McGuire and Bill McGuire, questions remain about who committed the crime. Was Melanie rightfully convicted, or were there crucial details missed? If she did commit the crime, could she have acted alone, or was someone else involved? Think again. Do you believe Melanie was guilty? Or are there unanswered questions that could lead to a different conclusion? Join us in exploring this captivating story together. The case may be closed. But the mysteries linger. And before you leave, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to Mysterious Hook, where we delve into the most intriguing cases that capture the imagination. Don't miss our latest investigations. Hit the notification bell to stay updated.